Thanks so much, Garen. I was looking around for the distinguished representative from Chicago. Um, I'm going to talk about some work on underground gun markets that I've been doing with Phil Cook, uh, Sudhir Venkatesh, and Anthony Braga. He's hiding in the audience, but he's implicated in this as well. Um, the, uh, as best we can tell, as best we can tell, only a small share of people who wind up using guns in crime in the United States every year um, got their guns directly from a licensed legal firearms dealer. And one of the implications of that is that um, the underground gun market uh, is presumably responsible for uh, the transmission of a large share of what turn out to be crime guns from legal gun dealers to the hands of the people who will wind up misusing them in crime. Um, this raises the question then of whether there's anything we can do to uh, intervene and disrupt those, uh, those markets. Now, um, <clears throat> lots of people have become very skeptical about the ability of public policy to do anything to disrupt underground markets based in large part from the sense of futility around our ability to do anything about under underground drug markets. If any of you have seen The Wire, which I hope everyone in this room has, every season of The Wire ends basically the same way. We take Avon Barksdale off the streets, and the last 15 minutes of every season shows some new drug crew moving seamlessly in to take over the drug corner and start dealing again. Uh, there are lots of people who believe that underground gun markets work just as well as drug markets and are just as resilient to law enforcement pressure, and so we can't win, why try? And so this is an ex uh, illustrative quote in uh, NYU law professor James Jacobs' book about um, uh, uh, gun control where he says some criminals claim that it's as easy to buy a gun on the streets as it is to buy fast food. One Chicago gang member said it's like going through the drive through window, give me some fries, a Coke, and a nine millimeter. Um, so given this conventional wisdom, we were uh, very surprised when um, we went out into the south side of Chicago, and uh, thanks in large part to the incredible ethnographic work of Sidir Venkatesh going out and talking to people in these underground gun markets on the street, um, generated a lot of evidence to indicate that the underground gun market works much, much differently uh, from how we think drug markets work. There's lots of evidence for frictions in the underground gun market that we don't see in underground drug markets. For instance, we see substantial price markups uh, in the underground market relative to legal prices. So cheap handguns that you could get for 150 bucks at a legal dealer in the suburbs of Chicago can trade for three or $400 on the streets of the south side of Chicago near where I uh, live and work. There are long wait times for people to track down guns in the underground gun market. Uh, a week or more, even for people who are well connected in the underground market. Wait times are even longer for ammunition. This is important. Ammunition is something that we don't pay nearly enough attention to in these discussions. A uh, handgun without uh, ammunition is basically just an incredibly ineffective club. Uh, a large share of purchase attempts in the underground market wind up going unfilled, again, even by people who are well connected in the underground market. And in the south side of Chicago, we can see there's a system of retail brokers who have developed who can charge up to $50 to try and put a buyer and a seller together, which is not something that you would expect to see in a market that is working as seamlessly well as James Jacobs is suggesting. Now, this raises the question, why, could, why would it be that the underground uh, drug market could work so well and the underground gun market might work so substantially less well? We think part of the explanation is that guns, unlike drugs, are durable goods. Uh, drug markets need lots and lots of transactions. They wind up having lots and lots of transactions for people to feed their habit. Because guns are a durable good, you need far less transactions in that market. And, uh, we think that that leads to making it much more difficult in a thin market like that for buyers and sellers to find one another, given that there's, uh, it's an illegal market and they can't do legal advertising to facilitate these exchanges. So we think uh, that one of the policy lessons to come out of our findings on the underground gun market uh, is that this might be a much more promising target for intervention than underground drug markets would be. So one thing that we should do is we should obviously be doing our very best to reduce theft through trying to get people to lock up their guns. Um, around a half a million guns are stolen every year in the United States. 
as best we can tell, those guns, by definition, go right into the hands of people who are criminals. Um, we should be doing more to investigate and close down dirty dealers. I think uh, Daniel Webster is going to be talking a little bit more about that uh, during the, um, the next presentation. I want to focus on two other things that, uh, on the law enforcement side that I think are incredibly important that we should be paying attention to. One thing is to take very seriously the idea of providing, providing rewards for information that leads to guns and to sellers of guns. Um, this can be cash. New York City Police Department uh, tried a pilot program many years ago where they would offer rewards up to $1,000 for information that leads to illegal guns. This is something the Chicago Police Department's think about trying now as well. And you can also think about rewards in the form of deals to people who are arrested. This is something that the New Jersey State Police have taken very seriously in my understanding, at least from the State Police, is that this is something that they believe to be very effective. The second thing that I want to mention is the possibility of carrying out uh, law enforcement uh, buy and bust and sell and bust operations in the underground gun market. I think one of the things that we want to be very sensitive to with that sort of intervention are the tremendous physical uh, risks involved to the participating officers. I'm sure many of you still remember the same article that, that I remember in the New York Times about two undercover NYPD officers being shot and killed as part of an operation that went bad. My understanding from people who are affiliated with, that, with the New York City Police Department is that they have developed new protocols and are now able to do those sorts of operations in a way that they believe does not compromise uh, officer safety. Given all of the different legal and political constraints that we face in trying to make progress in reducing gun violence in the United States, I think taking much more seriously the idea that gun markets really are very different from drug markets and provide a very promising target for intervention, this should be a margin that we are paying a lot more attention to in trying to reduce the toll of gun violence in the United States every year. Thank you very much.